Hello, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about efficient mechanism design in general settings and a really important result known as the revelation principle which help us to turn a really complicated problem into a tractable problem that we can actually solve. In order to get started we have to go to the very beginning of the semester when we talked about social choice problems where we were trying to figure out as a society how to choose a public policy that affected different people with typically different preferences. And the solution we came up with was that, that we wanted to choose what was, what was called a Pareto efficient allocation in general settings and in some settings with transferable utility that means where monetary transfers were possible and people have quasi linear preferences, doing so was equivalent to maximizing uh, the sum of utilities. So using what is known as the utilitarian criteria. There is a problem with doing that, however, which is that we need to know what are, what are the utility functions of different individuals. And in general, it is very often the case that um, each individual knows their own utility, but we as a society do not. And the problem we are going to try to solve for the rest of the semester is how to make social decisions that affect a number of people when the preferences of these individuals are private information to them. In our general framework, there is going to be a set of alternatives to choose from. In the roommate's problem, it was to buy or not to buy the espresso machine. A set of N individuals. In the roommate's problem, we had two individuals, Frankie and Gary. And for each individual, a quasi-linear utility function that depends on the value that the individual obtains from different alternatives minus the transfer that the individual has to pay. Sorry for writing type, it should say transfer, not type. In the case of the roommates, uh, the value from buying the coffee machine was just a number, uh, whereas the value of not buying the machine was equal to zero. I'll remind you that this kind of utility function is not without loss of generality. We typically think of quasi-linear utility function to be a good approximation of preferences when there are no income effects, so people are not really getting uh, significantly richer or poorer by the decisions that we're considering. And it's going to be very useful for us because it's going to allow us to characterize Pareto efficiency using the utilitarian criteria. An outcome is going to be efficient and alternative A is going to be efficient if and only if it maximizes the sum of the values of the different members of society. Okay, with that framework in mind, we can actually formulate the problem that we care about. Given that the preferences of different members of society are typically known only by them themselves, how can we design a game or a mechanism to implement the efficient outcomes that we would like to implement? I want you to think of a mechanism as nothing more than a game. In a game, we have for each player a set of actions. In the context of a mechanism, we're going to call them as a message space because what we want to do is we want players to, to tell us uh, what their preferences are. And then we need to have two functions that are going to determine as a function of the messages that we get from the players what is going to be the allocation or the outcome that is going, the alternative that is going to be chosen, and what is going to be the amount of money that each player is going to pay or receive. So we're going to call these two functions the allocation rule and the transfer rule. Let us look at a couple of examples to make sure that we are both on the same page. In the context of, of our roommate's dilemma, we studied uh, two mechanisms. In the one that we call the efficient mechanism, we asked the roommates to report us what their utility was. So the message space should be the set of possible values. Now if Frankie told us that her value was greater than 1000 or it was less than 1000 but Gary's value plus Frankie's value was greater than 1000, we should buy the machine and we should not buy it otherwise. As for the transfer rule, if Gary told us that she valued the machine more than 1000, then she would pay for it. If she didn't, but the sum of the two values was greater than 1,000, then Frankie would pay her own report and Gary would pay the rest. So this also tells us what, what Gary's transfer rule has to be. Uh, Gary would pay 1,000 minus Frankie's report uh, when Frankie's report is less than 1,000 but the machine is being bought. 
and uh, Gary would pay zero otherwise. All right, so this is just the same mechanism we, we studied last time, but now we can express it using the language that we have that we have proposed today. How about the other mechanism that we studied last class? In the 50-50 split mechanism, the roommates were not asked to tell us exactly how much they value the machine. We only asked them to tell us whether their value was greater than, than 500 or not. So the set of messages could just be the set 01, where a message of 1 means that they do value the machine more than 500, and a message of 0 means that they do not. Or a location rule was that we would buy the machine if and only if both roommates say yes, in which case each of the two roommates would pay 500. So that also gives us the transfer rule. Notice that a mechanism, together with the preferences of the individuals, defines a, a normal form game. We have actions for each player, we have a set of players, and we have a way of, of determining utilities as a function of, of actions. So that's what we call a game and we can solve it using the assumptions that we have talked about before. For the rest of the semester we're going to use assumption 2 which was the assumption that players are cautious and I'll remind you that that means that um, they never choose actions which are weakly dominated by a different action. Because in mechanism design we get to design the game ourselves we often can work with very robust solution concepts like cautiousness instead of relying on more restrictive assumptions such as rationalizability or equilibrium. Now there are typically two really different problems that we study in mechanism design. One problem is the so-called optimal mechanism design problem in which we think of we're trying to maximize the utility of the individual designing the mechanism. For instance, this could be the problem of a monopolist that's trying to maximize its profits designing a, a, a form of price discrimination. And that's something that you might want to study in different classes. In this class, we're going to study the problem of efficient mechanism design, which has the question of whether we can find a mechanism that's going to maximize social welfare. And for us, social welfare, it's going to mean uh, Pareto efficiency. Given our assumptions, um, we're going to be looking for efficient mechanisms, meaning mechanisms uh, for which the predicted outcomes, using assumption 2, uh, always maximize the sum of the values of the individuals. In general, doing mechanism design may look like a daunting task because there are so many different possible mechanisms. However, we're going to restrict attention to a very simple class of mechanisms called direct mechanisms. In a direct mechanism, the rules are very simple. Each agent is simply asked to report their own preferences, which sometimes I will call their types. Uh, the reports are simultaneous and independent, and then an outcome is, is, is uh, determined based on these preferences. So what really defines a direct mechanism is the fact that the message space is just a set of possible values that the individuals have. For example, the efficient mechanism we discussed earlier today and last class is a direct mechanism because the message spaces are just a set of possible values. In contrast, example 2, the 50-50 split mechanism, is not a direct mechanism because the message space is not the set of possible values, but we could transform it into a direct mechanism by enlarging the message space to include the set of possible values and um, adjusting the transfer rule and the location rule accordingly. Within the class of direct mechanisms, we're going to restrict attention to those direct mechanisms in which cautious players always want to tell the truth. That is, mechanisms where lying is weakly dominated by telling the truth. We call such mechanisms incentive compatible. So you can think of incentive compatibility as players having incentives to always tell the truth. You can go back to last video to see one mechanism which is incentive compatible and one mechanism which is not. All right, and now we are finally in position to state the revelation principle, which is the result that makes mechanism design possible to begin with. The revelation principle is going to tell us that restricting attention to direct incentive compatible mechanisms is without loss of generality. If we can find some mechanism that it's potentially very complicated that delivers the outcome that we want, 
then we can also find an incentive compatible direct mechanisms that delivers exactly the same app. So for the rest of the semester, we're going to focus only on this restrictive class of mechanisms to try to search for a mechanism that, um, that achieves part efficiency. And we're going to start by talking about a famous mechanism known as the Vickery mechanism. See you next time.